Hey everyone, we have a, a large crowd today, so I'm just going to give it a, a, a couple of seconds to make sure everyone has a chance to hop onto Zoom. So I'm a New Yorker and I'm already becoming impatient. <laughs> so let me get started. Um, I'm Ellie Dahoney. I'm the Senior Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at Research America. Um, first off, thank you very much for joining us today. And for those of you who are not familiar with Research America, we're a national a nonprofit, nonpartisan alliance. And our um, the 300 plus organizations from across the country in our alliance, we're unified in believing that our nation can and should do more to speed medical and public health progress. And I'd, I'd like to take a second to thank um, the many congressional champions from both sides of the aisle. Um, medical progress is a nonpartisan priority who have helped to ensure our nation leads the fight against um, deadly and debilitating health threats. Um, uh, also, I want to say that, as you know, today is a quick one-on-one um, -on, -one on NIH, um, uh, the global leader, actually, in basic biomedical research. And that's not all NIH does. But um, we have, I'm so thrilled to say, um, two national leaders in this arena. I'm not thrilled to say my phone's ringing. But I just stopped it. Um, and there are links to the bios for our distinguished uh, um, speakers today in the chat. I think it's in the chat, or uh, I believe so. Um, and first, let me introduce our moderator, um, a, a, actually a board member emeritus and former chair of Research America's board of directors, um, a nationally um, and, and really a leading health policy expert not just nationally, but internationally known health policy expert um, and, a, and a, a top journalist um, over the last decades, uh, Susan Denser. And she's currently the president and CEO of America's Physician Groups. Um, joining Susan for this fireside chat is Dr. Ned Sharpless. Um, he is a professor of medicine, um, cancer policy and innovation at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. And among his many, many distinctions, Dr. Sharpless uh, served as the director of the National Cancer Center at the, um, the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health under the Trump and Biden administrations. So if you wouldn't mind typing your questions into the chat, um, there'll be no Q&A Zoom function today. We'll pose as many questions as we can during the audience um, Q&A portion. Um, Welcome all and thank you again. Um, and let me turn it over to you, Susan. Great. Thank you so much, Ellie, for that lovely introduction. And Ned, welcome to you. It's great to speak with you on this very important topic, the essentials of NIH. And of course, it's a timely one since there's now reportedly going to be a new NIH director nominee, Dr. Monica Bertinoli, a noted cancer clinician and researcher. Since last fall, of course, she's been filling your former shoes at the National Cancer Institute, and apparently she will now be nominated to succeed uh, Dr. Francis Collins as NIH director. We'll talk about the role of the NIH director a bit later, but let's start with the big picture. We have the National Institutes of Health, an organization that's collectively been funded at the, to the tune of about $49 billion in the current fiscal year to undertake the research that Ellie referenced. What's the fundamental mission of the NIH? Right, yeah, no, th thank you for having me today to talk about this really important topic and something I care passionately about. You know, I worked at the NIH at the NCI, at the National Cancer Institute for five years in two administrations and I, you know, um, I love that agency and love the work of that agency. And you know, a, a few general points to make it, it's one of the great nonpartisan things in DC. I mean, when I would walk around Congress and talk about trying to cure cancer, that's really not a Democrat or Republican perspective on that issue. Every, everybody wants to make biomedical progress, re research in biomedical progress, and to do better for our patients. And, and, and so the, the mission of the NIH is, is uh, highly respected. And, 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 and I, I think it's also important to say the NIH has been highly successful in that regard. It really is sort of the envy of the world in terms of a sophisticated biomedical research enterprise that has this interesting, you know, kind of government piece that works with academia and then also works with industry and it coordinates research among, you know, these groups in a very successful way. 
Uh, you know, the NIH is large and it's a, it's a significant budget and it's an appropriate question to ask, is the NIH doing things right? And is it spending its money on the right questions? And, you know, that's, those, are, those make for lively discussions. But I think an important point is that the NIH is overall quite a successful agency in terms of its mission of promoting uh, biomedical research. And so the NIH is, I think most people are aware, is really not one thing. It's divided up into multiple institutes and centers. There are 27 of those. Each one has a specific focus. So the National Cancer Institute works on cancer, allergy and infectious disease works on allergy and infectious disease, heart, lung, and blood, work, et cetera. And, uh, and uh, that, that structure allows for research focus in areas that have been designated of importance by Congress. Uh, that also um, provides uh, some flexibility among the agencies to do things slightly differently. So not all parts of the NIH function exactly the same manner. And so the NIH is then tasked to support research, both through an intramural program on the campus out in Bethesda and extramurally uh, across the nation, predominantly by funding academic and industry partners, uh, and also to sort of create infrastructure for research. And that, that has a variety of uh, creating sort of centers of research excellence and training the next generation of scientists and providing specific facilities with research capabilities. And then it also has to, uh, you know, work on things Congress tells it to work to on. For, for example, during the uh, COVID pandemic, Congress directed a lot of funding to the NIH specifically for COVID related questions that were quite pressing at the time. And, uh, you know, Congress has specific priorities related to biomedical research that come up every year. And that is conveyed to the NIH in a variety of means, including report language and specific, you know, appropriations and other, me other mechanisms. So to, suffice to say, the NIH, I think, successfully coordinates this big, you know, national biomedical research uh, need and uh, does that quite well in, in, and does that through interacting with other parts of government and with academia and with industry. Great. Well, thanks for that terrific uh, overview. So let's talk about the role that NIH plays in the broader health and science research ecosystem vis-a-vis -vis other federal agencies, because there are a couple also that engage in uh, biomedical research and not so much biomedical always, but related health areas of research. Distinguish for us the role of NIH versus, for example, the Department of Defense, which funds some medical research, or BARDA, the other agencies that are involved uh, in health-related research. Right. This is a really important topic because, um, you know, while the NIH budget is large, it is you know, not sufficiently uh, large and doesn't have sufficient capabilities to address all of America's research needs, particularly in biomedical research. And so I, I think appropriately, there are other agencies that uh, conduct biomedical research and related you know, basic biology investigations. And so those would be things like, you know, within HHS, there's the FDA does some research, the CDC uh, funds some research as well. Uh, BARDA, as you mentioned, uh, you know, has specific uh, re research goals related to predominantly biodefense and preparedness. Uh, outside of HHS, the DOE funds some interesting basic biology, biologic research. The DOD uh, has a large congressionally uh, directed uh, research program, particularly with a cancer focus, but in other areas of biology as well. And then uh, uh, also um, the NSF, you know, the National Science Foundation uh, funds quite a bit of basic research, some of which, you know, starts spilling into biology. I, I think it's important to understand that um, you know, that, that, that sort of panoply of federal agencies doing research exists because these agencies have specific needs. So the kind of science, you know, when I ran the FDA, uh, that we supported the FDA was very applied and, you know, was sort of like, how quickly does this pill dissolve or things like that? It, was, it wasn't the kind of science the NCI would fund or the NIH would fund. It's very, very important science for the regulatory mission of the FDA, but different from what the NIH would do. Similarly, the NSF, if you looked at it, it's, there's a lot of like particle physics and stuff in there. It's not really basic biology. But, you know, at, at some point, uh, you know, chemistry is just physics, and at some point that runs into biology. And so there is a little bit of overlap between topics funded by the NSF and the NIH, for example. So, so I think that, uh, you know, each of these agencies tries to fund research uh, related to the mission uh, for which Congress has appropriated those funds. And I, I think for the most part, that is successfully done, that we stay in our lanes and cooperate among the agencies and respect the, uh, you know, expertise of different agencies. And, and I, I think that was a, a, a quite a, a, a highlight of my career in government was the ability to work with other agencies to coordinate research missions. So, for example, when I was at NCI, we had a very lively three-way research program with the DOD and the Veterans Affairs, the VA, uh, related to sort of the, uh, the, the cancer health, or the cancer characteristics of the American warfighter and veterans. And so it was a 
sort of genomics effort coordinated by the NIH, uh, the Mertha Cancer Center, the Mertha Cancer Institute at, at, at uh, Walter Reed, at the, D, the DOD facility, as well as some of the VA hospitals. And that was a really exciting, uh, gratifying research to be able to do science about what was causing cancer in that population in a coordinated way across the agency. So I, I think that um, it is sometimes a little confusing why it seems like, you know, different parts of the government are, are all doing uh, biomedical research. But I, I think it works, and there's a method to that uh, congressional madness, it's apparently. Right, great. Well, good to hear about the coordination effort, as you said, to make sure agencies are staying in their lane, but overlapping when it's important to overlap uh, and, and work together in areas of research. Let's talk about the role of NIH versus the research undertaken in the private sector, commercial research, uh, for example, vis-a-vis uh, -vis pharmaceutical companies. We know that actually most of the research carried out in the country today uh, is driven by the commercial sector, uh, and it's represented most of the growth in R&D over the last decade. So what is the NIH role vis-a-vis -vis that commercial sector? Yeah, when I was at NCI, I would get this question all the time, and it would come in two flavors. You know, certain members of Congress say, why do we have an NIH at all? We should do it all in the private sector. And others would say, why doesn't the NIH do, you know, develop all the drugs? Why do we need the private sector, right? And, and, and so I, I think the answer is um, they, they complement each other highly. Uh, it is correct to say that if you looked at it on a spend level, like how much money is spent on biomedical research, there's more money being spent in industry than at the NIH because uh, you know drug discovery and development of uh, development of commercial products is very expensive. Those activities, you know, to make a, a research idea into a medicine is a quite expensive endeavor that requires you know regulatory oversight by the FDA and lots of uh, sort of uh, you know uh, science that is uh, required for regulatory filings that isn't necessarily investigator initiated kind of curiosity driven science. So so you know the the, the that's I think how the at interaction is successful is. Um, you know, the NIH, for the most part, funds more kind of basic biological in investigation and also funds sort of translational research where industry doesn't want to work for a variety of reasons. So there are areas of translational and clinical research that, is, that are not well, well addressed by industry, and that's where the NIH tries to step in and do some research. But, you know, when, when there's clearly a commercial path for an idea to, you know, become a marketed product, then the NIH steps back and the industry takes over. And, and that, that transfer of intellectual property works very successfully in the United States through a, a legal structure created by Congress, for example, the Bayh-Dole Act, which allows NIH-funded commercial science and academic institutions to turn into, or, or NIH-funded science and academic institutions to turn into commercial science. So, you know, very uh, successful uh, uh, legal framework that's been set up over the decades. I can tell you this is not the case in every country that, that funds biomedical research. And many scientists that work in other other countries are very envious of the flexibility that scientists have in the United States to you know sort of take their idea that they got with government funding and develop with government funding and, and turn that into a, a useful product. So I, I think that works. It, it, the NIH would not be the right place to do all of this commercial science that uh, that uh, needs to be done. I think that that industry has that's a good is is a right role for the private sector. But also, you know, I, I think the NIH does need to exist to sort of get the ball rolling with those basic biologic investigations, because those are it, that's science. It's hard to know where those things are going to go. And uh, so so they sort of have to be funded by, um, you know, people who just want to understand how biology works. It's unclear what the commercial use of some of that will be. Uh, one other thing to mention is, as I said, there are certain topics where industry doesn't really um, work so well. So an example would be in cancer, for example. Uh, you know, often we would try and de-escalate therapy where you try and find patients who need less treatment. So, you know, and it's not really an industry's interest to show that a patient needs less of their drug. So those sorts of de-escalation clinical trials were something that I thought the NCI should do. And, uh, you know, and, and we, where, where the NCI's really had a, a very important impact on patient care. So there are uh, some kinds of translational questions where the NIH does have to do the, do the research, but there are others where it's really best left to industry. Well, we can also think about uh, the important role that NIH plays in starting at this very basic research level when it's going to be decades before commercial products are available. We can think of gene therapy, where the first human trials were done, were NIH funded in the 90s. And it's now finally, now 30 years later, that we're going to see actual therapies, are seeing actual therapies in areas like sickle cell. 
uh, it's a long pipeline and industry can't always straddle that entire pipeline. It has to be a public investment up front, right? Right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I think the important feature there is, is often you just don't know how long it's going to take. Like, you, you know, gene therapy is a good idea, right? I mean, it, 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 is, it is a plausible thing to try, but it, it wasn't at all clear when those experiments started out in the 80s that, uh, you know, it would take decades for them to really become uh, useful products. But they are now, thanks to lots of basic biologic investigation. And what we're sort of seeing, you know, I, I would say a related, uh, a very much top of mind topic right now is this issue of bespoke medicines, you know. Medicines that are totally personalized, meaning they're developed just for a single individual. So that's useful for some, you know, congenital, you know, uh, inborn errors of metabolism, for example, so, some some diseases that children are born with. It's also probably a useful approach in cancer. And uh, you know, the science is going on hot and heavy today. You know, that's being developed in labs across the country, but it is unclear what the sort of commercial and regulatory path of those technologies is going to be in the future. Uh, that's not slowing the science down. I mean, we're, we're doing those experiments now to figure out how to work with, with the hope and belief that as, as that science becomes more mature, you know, the FDA and industry will figure out how to regulate those, that, that topic and, and industry will figure out how to commercialize it. But so it's really important that, uh, you know, these things that may have a very long lead time before they become uh, useful for, uh, for, for humans, that they still can get uh, support and uh, get attention from the federal government through the NIH. You mentioned the 27 institutes and centers at NIH, and some of them, of course, are very well known, like the NCI or the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases that uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci led until recently. Um, Francis Collins led another uh, important one, which was the National Human uh, Genome Research Institute, which, of course, was the institute that published the first draft of the human genome back in 2000. Among all of these centers, what's the role of the NIH director? Yeah, the, the NIH um, is uh, sort of a, a mix of academia, academia and the federal government in a way that is very interesting. And that, that structure is you know, not nearly as uh, sort of operationally uh, uh, rigid as, say, uh, you know, the DOD, for example. Um, you know, that, that structure, I think, allows each sort of IC, each institute and center, uh, some flexibility to, uh, you know, support science in the way they see best for the research questions they're tasked with. And, uh, you know, it, it's a fair question to ask, is 27 the right number? Should it be a larger or smaller number? Uh, one of the one of the prior NIH directors, Harold Varmus, uh, you know, was on record as saying he thought 27 was too, was, that was too many, that, that, that really some consolidation might not be a bad idea. And, you know, some of that structure is historical, as, you know, I, in, institutes have been brought up as, Congress wanted specific focus in an area like drug abuse, for example. Uh, they, so that that's the, the the why it exists, and I think in some ways it, it works pretty well. Uh, although, as I said, it's a fair question to ask: Is that the optimal administrative structure to administer our federal research dollar? The NIH director there is really important. So they uh, the NIH has a bunch of centralized functions. So things like you know human resources is fairly centralized in terms of. Uh, you know, some of the hiring functions of the NIH and some of the contracting functions additionally of the NIH. So there's some administrative centralization that is that provides efficiency. I think also the NIH director has the most visible role in biomedical research in the United States and is clearly the leading advocate to Congress for the need for additional funding and other authorities for the NIH. And, and I think, you know, Dr. Collins in particular was wonderfully effective in that regard. The NIH budget did very well uh, during the period that Francis ran the NIH, and I, he was a great spokesperson for the NIH down in Congress because he was, you know, uh, clearly nonpartisan. He 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 would stress that uh, NIH research is a is a is a bipartisan public good in many ways, and uh, and I think that um, you know that that leadership was was key to the uh, budgetary success of the agency, you know, of the, of the national of the National Institute of Health over the period when I was there, for example. So I, 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 I worry that, um, you know, we need to continue that in the future. We, we need to, for the Congress to understand the important mission of the NIH, that it's fundamentally nonpartisan, and that it's uh, something that serves all Americans. And the NIH director is really the main cheerleader, if you will, to bring that message to Congress. And often has been the voice of getting the institutes to work together better and to work across silos on important topics as well. Yeah, no, I mean that that's the fear, right? Of, of that many ICs that there could be some siloing and some 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 structure. And and uh, you know, we work hard to make sure that doesn't happen, but 
uh, administrative structure does drive uh, funding as we or do, uh, disbursement decisions in some instances. And so I think it's a good question to ask is like that the right way the, for the NIH to work in the future? So you mentioned the distinction between intramural, basically within NIH research versus the extramural research. And we know that most of it is on the extramural side, basically four out of every $5 goes out the door to fund research around the country. Let's talk about the, important, uh, the importance of that bolus of money and funding going throughout the research apparatus across the country, particularly in universities. Yeah, no, I, I think this is probably one of the topics that is most misunderstood by members of Congress who don't, you know, who aren't carefully affiliated with the, who don't, you know, appropriate the NIH or authorize the NIH and maybe don't think about it as much. But the, um, you know, I, I found many members of Congress think of the NIH as like the hospital out in Bethesda. That is uh, one portion of the intramural program, but certainly, as you mentioned, the bulk of the NIH's spending does not occur in Maryland. It goes out across the country to uh, all congressional districts, particularly those with academic research institutions. And it's billions of dollars that support, you know, the university or cancer center or research institution uh, near your hometown. Uh, so the intramural program is important. I mean, that is where uh, the uh, NIH can sort of direct some federal research on topics that um, are a key national priority. And certainly uh, the success of the intramural program is undisputed. I mean, you know, Steve Rosenberg is there today doing some of the most innovative cancer work in the world. Uh, recently, an NIH scientist won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of hepatitis virus. So, I mean, the science of the intramural program is very, very strong. It also provides a mechanism should the NIH need research in a specific area, like right now, immediately, that's the federal facilities we use. So I can tell you a lot of the early COVID research, which was a national emergency, occurred at Frederick National Lab, which is something that's run in part by the intramural program of the NCI and, and, and to a lesser extent, NIAID. So, so that was, uh, you know, uh, the ability to say, we need some federal scientists to work on this topic today. And, Similarly, you know, that the intramural program has taken up things like the op opioid epidemic uh, as directed by Congress in the past. So the intramural program uh, is the ability to sort of direct some research immediately. But the extramural program is, from a dollar spend point of view, more important. It's 80 percent of the budget, as you said, and it, it is the funds that go to uh, universities and research institutes that allow scientists to do uh, their work, really, to allow those, those universities to be, uh, you know, major research universities. And that is, uh, I think, very successful approach. It allows for this sort of flexibility of, you know, faculty at research institutions to work on topics of their choosing uh, if they can convince the NIH it's a good idea to support their research. And that, as you know, is done through a rigorous peer review process and for the most part. So proposals are sent to the NIH and uh, are vetted by dispassionate experts who say this is the key science we need to fund. So I think that's a, that's a successful model that uh, has led to really remarkable innovation in biomedical discovery. If you look at how, like, say, treatment for cancer or, you know, now even we're seeing success in Alzheimer's disease for the first time ever, you know, th those, those, uh, those, those therapies that are having such an impact on patients today came from that structure, you know, predominantly extramural funds to uh, academic institutions doing science for decades, leading to these uh, entities through a cooperation with commercial entities and industry. Let's talk a little bit more about how Congress funds the NIH. It's not the case that a big check for $49 billion goes over to the director who then divvies it up. Actually, Congress specifically appropriates funding for the various institutes, including uh, the NCI, which is the single biggest institute in terms of funding, almost uh, about $7 billion. Um, how, how does that work with Congress basically very uh, closely targeting the funding that goes institute by institute. Let's talk about that first, and then let's talk about the case for increasing that funding. Right. I think that uh, that is an important point that is uh, not readily appreciated by everyone, that, that really each of the institutes and centers has its sort of own line item budget that is decided by Congress. And I think Congress likes that because that allows them to announce their priorities. You know, we want more funding for drug abuse, so they give it to NIDA, or they give a plus up to the cancer when they uh, want support for cancer research. Or for many years, uh, for maybe the last decade, there's been quite vigorous support specifically to the institutes that fund Alzheimer's research. So the National Institute of Aging and the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, NINDS. So, you know, that, that, uh, that line item structure allows for the, uh, 
uh, Congress to, uh, in, in some effect, designate certain priorities and, 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 and favor certain areas of research. And that is appropriate. You know, the NIH exists to uh, do the research that Congress and its constituents want done. Uh, the, um, the, it does have a little bit of a problem, though, in that uh, sometimes there are, it, it can lead to siloing. And so I think, you know, Francis and others wisely appreciated that it would be beneficial for the director's office to have some funding to sort of lead trans NIH initiatives. And so that led to uh, a big increase in funding for the office of the director at the NIH, and particularly for this entity called the Common Fund. And that's a common fund of monies that is spent on projects that are sort of are benefit more than one institute or center. And so that's worked on things like, you know, the role of inflammation and variety of diseases. There's been a common fund initiative on workforce development. There's been a common fund initiative on sort of, you know, the biology of aging, which, you know, you can imagine uh, applies to multiple different disease areas. So I think that's been a successful program that leads to uh, this interaction between the institutes and centers and the director's office. And so, so, so I think that works. I, I think that that allows Congress to have control and some say over what, what the NIH should be working on and provides flexibility to the various institutes and centers to sort of work on the, uh, to address science in the way they see fit, but also gives the NIH director some control to shape the national remission, national research mission in a beneficial way. Right. And now let's talk about the case for increasing NIH funding. A lot of people point to something called the Biomedical Research and Development Price Index, which is frankly uh, looking at the uh, pace of growth of pricing in the biomedical research arena. And adjusted for that inflation, the NIH budget isn't really growing very fast. In fact, if anything, it's grown only marginally in a couple of years if we compare it against that index. Why is that a problem? Yeah, this is the bird pie you speak of and something that we closely watch at the NIH. And it, it sort of is the rate of inflation for biomedical research. You can think of it that way. And, you know, I think the data show that, you know, NIH funding is a good use of federal dollars, that the support for biomedical research is a good use of federal monies. There are lots of pieces of evidence for that. Um, you know, one I like is that it's effectively like every drug the FDA approves. If you look far enough back, there was some NIH funded grant at the beginning of that medicine story. So the, the science that the NIH supported, you know, is key to the biomedical research progress. Although to be clear, a lot of that science happens outside of the NIH in industry and industry's role is very important too. But, you know, the, the NIH is sort of very successful at, you know, providing the catalytic function, if you will, the, the ability to sort of get, you know, some of those projects lifted off the ground. So I, I think that, uh, you know, NIH support has been a good use of uh, federal monies. Uh, and has led to a benefit for the American taxpayer. And I would also argue that, um, uh, you know, this is a, a clearly an area where there uh, exists tremendous need. So one measure of that, for example, is the number of applications to funding for the NIH. And, and, and so, uh, and that, that has uh, led to really steep competition. So when I was at the National Cancer Institute, for example, this market increase in applications to the NCI ha caused us to have very low success rates. And so, Clearly, there was this demand for research uh, at academic institutions that the NI, NCI, for example, is not fully able to meet because of this intense competition for funding. So, you know, you can see there's, um, you know, there's a willingness and an existing infrastructure to do the science. And when the science is, you know, paid for, it leads to good things. So I, I would argue that uh, NIH support is, is one of the best things that Congress can choose to do with federal monies. Now, I realize, you know, Congress is a tough job and this is going to be a tough budget year. And there's going to be a particular focus on uh, discretionary spending. And so things like the NIH, you know, tough questions are going to be asked about, you know, is that the right way to spend federal monies? But I, I would argue that if you look at sort of the, the facts, you know, if you look at the data of what uh, research expenditures lead to in terms of American competitiveness, American innovation and, uh, you know, jobs and biomedical research products, uh, I think the NIH is a, is a really good bet. And again, if we adjust for this bird pie, as you call it, the, the Biomedical Price Inflation Index, uh, NIH funding is only about 1% higher uh, now in 2023 compared to uh, 20 years ago. So there right. really it, it, has The bird pie is always a bit higher than regular inflation. And now, of course, regular inflation is pretty high to begin with. So yeah, the, the cost of doing science are uh, you know increasing at a significant rate. And so, you know, in effect, sort of a flat budget for the NIH is actually a bad budget because 
uh, all of those grants that it had that have your costs have uh, you know increases built into them. So that really means that uh, you know the the ability to support new projects is going to drop significantly, uh, you know, without a, an appropriate increase in the NIH uh, uh, appropriation. Uh, and as you mentioned, there's a huge supply of great ideas and great researchers. So there's huge demand for it. We have a lot of unmet need, uh, rare diseases that need further exploration, et cetera. Uh, that's had a real effect on what we call the pay lines when research is, uh, dollars are doled out at NIH. Talk briefly about what's happened to those so-called pay lines. Yeah, I mean, this used to really keep me up at night. I mean, you know, so... Um... Uh, at one point, uh, when I was director of the National Cancer Institute, uh, the pay line for an established investigator R01, meaning sort of the workhorse grant of the NCI, was as low as 8%, meaning that, uh, you know, your chances of getting that grant were, you had better luck getting into Harvard, right? I mean, it's really, really low. Uh, and uh, that that is not a sustainable number. I, I think people will, will see that and decide, I don't want to be a cancer researcher because that's too low. Now, Congress has identified, has been has been sensitive to that problem and has increased funding to the NCI. And I think pay lines have improved since then, but they're still pretty low. I think they may be up to as high as 12% now. But, you know, that would keep me up because I would think, wow, you know, 92% of grants or 90% of grants we're not supporting. We, we might be leaving the cure for pancreatic cancer, you know, kind of unfunded out there, you know, it, because we're just unable to get to it. Because, you know, peer review is, is uh, the best way to disperse funds, but it's not perfect. And it, we certainly occasionally miss really good proposals. And so, so I think, you know, a, a very low pay lines uh, creates um, a, a bad culture, a bad milieu for science internationally and leads uh, scientists to get turned off and go into other fields or to go into industry. And, it, and that's fine. You know, it, science working in industry is good, but we also need a, a cadre of NIH supported academic researchers as well. And so that intense competition for funding is, uh, I think, very detrimental to the sort of scientific workforce, if you will. And so the, you know, the NIH works very hard for a number of reasons to uh, try and make sure pay lines are as, as, as high as possible. But really, you know, for example, the, the low pay lines at the NCI were not caused by like, inflation or mismanagement of the funds, it was caused by this tremendous influx in new applications. You know, all these scientists, these creative people have these great ideas of how to like cure cancer and treat patients. And they'd send those ideas to the NCI. And, you know, we would say, wow, that's a good idea. We, I hope we can fund this. But unfortunately, to all too many ideas we couldn't get to. Right. Seven billion dollars sounds like a lot, but in the context of cancer, it's not that much. It's yeah, and certainly if you think of the national, the costs of cancer every year, it's, you know, it's hundreds of billions of dollars a year and just for care alone, not to mention missed work and, and, and the tragedy of having a loved one die of cancer. So, you know, I, so cancer is a very, very expensive problem for the United States and uh, seven billion dollars, not a lot of money. And I think you can make a similar argument for heart disease or drug abuse or uh, Alzheimer's or the list goes on. So the work of the NIH is, I think, a good return on investment. Well, we have a lot more we can and probably will talk about, including, for example, the role of NIH in funding research that actually takes place in other countries overseas. Maybe we'll get to that, but right now I'd like to go to any questions that have come in from the audience. So let's take some of those. Ashley? Hi, yes, thank you so much. Um, we do have a number of questions from the audience, so thank you and please keep them coming. We are moderating the chat. I think what would be um, most relevant to this discussion um, is will we ever get back to the 30% funding levels of um, NIH applications that were averaged in the 90s, parts of the 90s? Um, it looks like numbers are around 22% today. Can you speak to that? So this gets back to the conversation we were just having about these so-called pay lines, Ned? Yeah, I, I think uh, that would be a, a healthier number. I, I think uh, sort of the high 20s or 30% range is, is better for research. Certainly 8% is too low or even 12% at the NCI now. You know, different ICs have different pay lines. Some don't even publish a pay line, report a pay line. But I, I think the, the idea of about, you know, less than, you know, around 20% of grants across the NIH get funded is the number I, I keep in mind. And I, I think that's on the low side. And certainly it was higher historically. Um, and, and I think uh, if you wanted to do that, uh, you know, for example, at National Cancer Institute, we really, you really couldn't do that by sort of, you know, cutting funds from other parts of the Institute and sending it to the pay lines because 
we've already done that for the most part. You know, the things that are, that are preserved are really popular things like the, the national, you know, the cancer centers program, which is which is a very very good program that the NCI runs that, you know, has not enjoyed the same funding increases that say other parts of the NCI have. So I think that um, really the only way to boost pay lines, uh, yeah, for the most part, is 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 through an increased appropriation to the NIH. And I think that uh, that's a laudable goal. Now, it is important to note that, uh, you know, since the 90s, academic institutions have learned they like being NIH funded. They like having faculty that work on science. They like the acclaim this brings to their institution. They like having cutting edge new technologies that they can use in their hospitals. And so, uh, you know, the, the institutes certainly have benefited from NIH funding and have therefore really tried to increase the size of their research infrastructure. And so, the academic research infrastructure that exists today is much larger than, say, it was 30 years ago. You know, if you go to any major university, you'll see new science buildings and new, new wings of hospitals and whatnot. But uh, again, I think that has been the design. That's, I think, what Congress wanted. They wanted to you know, fund the research mission of the United States and the infrastructure to accommodate that mission had to grow. Let's take another question, Ashley, from the audience. This is great. And please keep these questions rolling in. I'm going to ask a question that we talked, that you both um, discussed maybe two questions ago about peer review and how we can kind of miss some of the some of these really good applications. Um, peer review can fail since reviewers tend to fund people that they might know in the field that they're familiar with. Um, but less support for new areas or neglected areas. Um, this is a little bit of kind of polishing off your crystal ball. How do you think the NIH can change that? Well, and Ned, if you would take a moment to describe the role of study groups in essentially evaluating grant applications and making decisions about them. Yeah, uh, peer review is a really important topic. I mean, that's sort of where the rubber is the mode. If, if Congress gives you this money and you don't appropriate it through a wise process, that would defeat the whole purpose. So peer review is key. Uh, so let me say a few words about it. The way it, peer review mostly looks like this. It looks like well, in the old days, it was 30 scientists would get in a room together and read a bunch of grants at the same time and say, I like this one, I don't like that one, through a fairly elaborate scoring system. In the, in the modern era, a lot of that happens virtually. A lot of peer review is done uh, by virtual study section. Uh, that, the pandemic uh, led to that major innovation. And uh, actually, that's been a good thing. I think uh, that allows you to get reviewers from all over the country. You know, people from Seattle didn't want to fly to DC to be on study section. So, you know, getting West Coast reviewers was challenging. So I think virtual review has been in many ways uh, good. It also saves a lot of money, frankly, for not having to travel these scientists and put them up at hotels. So it's it's both cost efficient and I think leads to greater diversity of reviewers. So, uh, you know, virtual peer review and the technology has improved dramatically to, to make that happen. So I think that's been an asset. But for the most part, those study sections are created by the part of the NIH called the Center for Scientific Review, CSR. Uh, the majority of NIH grants are scored by CSR study sections. And uh, CSR is intensely interested in like how to make peer review better they've they do experiments like is blinded peer review better than peer review where you know the uh, author of the of the grant is uh you know is is this scoring system better than that scoring system uh, you know are limits to sort of uh parts of the application a wise thing to do so csr is constantly asking what's the best way to do peer review because it is such an important part of the nci the nih's mission the, the, the other institutes do some of their own peer review as well, uh, occasionally. So the, you know, the NCI used to run study sections uh, for a variety of special purposes. And that was like often when we had a, 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 an area where we thought the, the general study sections wouldn't have adequate scientific expertise or for a specific function of the NCI. I mentioned the cancer center program. So those centers are reviewed by a dedicated uh, you know, peer review study section that the NCI runs. Now, this issue of like, uh, you know, great ideas get missed in peer review is real. So, you know, you can see, for example, sometimes a grant will go to one study section and it gets a terrible score. And then the same grant goes to a different study section with a different research focus and they love it, right? Because the, the, the biases of the reviewers really matter. So there's, there's plenty of data that um, peer review, while sort of the best way to do this is, is an imperfect process. And so one continually asks questions like, you know, how can we make peer review better? I, I will say that the problem that was specifically mentioned that, uh, you know, a certain research area isn't getting enough sort of biomedical research love, if you will, it's not getting, you know, those grants aren't doing well in study sections. Uh, you know, one way the NIH addresses that is by creating, you know, research funding opportunities, RFAs, around specific topics and saying, we want a bunch of applications on long COVID, or we want a bunch of applications on, 
you know, antimicrobial resistance, or we want a bunch of applications on pancreatic cancer or whatever. And, and then we'll create a dedicated study section with the right expertise to try and uh, uh, get, uh, you know, more, more success in an area that the NIH would like to catalyze. Now, you can imagine there's wide debate at the NIH about how much sort of top-down science the NIH ought to be doing. You know, institutes like the NIGMS, the sort of General Medical Sciences Institute, do very little, you know, uh, RFA-driven science. They just want to fund the best applications. Whereas the NCI, as you can imagine, uses a lot of RFAs to direct research questions that we would have liked to have seen. So, uh, you know, it is, I think, a good question for Congress to ask, you know, does peer review work as well as we'd like? Because it is really uh, critical. I think it, it does work pretty well, although uh, it's something that we have to pay continual attention to and always make better. One last thing to say about it, there has been an innovation in peer review which is the ability to sort of start analyzing all the work of these study sections through artificial intelligence. So that was just beginning when I, when I left the NIH and we were very interested in having like the AI tools read the grants and sort of see if we could correlate features of uh, review. Uh, and certainly it was good at like binning research, you know, where were all the grants going and uh, you know, what study section was seeing what kind of grant and those kinds of things. So I, I think AI will uh, actually be a useful tool that will help peer review in many ways. You know, and then you talk about a crystal ball because that was the next question right at the top of mind. So we're going to skip over that one. Okay. Though it's fantastic. And thank you. AI is exciting in lots of areas, it, including peer review. Right. Yeah. Very, it very much is. Um, one more question when we're talking about peer review, and then we'll move on to another subject because the questions are coming in fast and furious. Um, if, if you can speak a little bit to the criteria used to measure the completion of an investigation, how to ensure projects aren't being left behind, are there any more statistics? And, you know, I know that, that we just talked a little bit about AI, but the importance of the research activities and how it's being discussed in the NIH, even a little bit on that, and then we'll move, we'll move to a, a different topic. I'm not totally sure, I just, is the question about how we decide to award things or how do we tell the awards were successful? So I think what we're looking at is the criteria used to to see if the if the project is successful and how to ensure that projects aren't left behind. I know you spoke a little bit about that just recently, but if you can go a little bit into more maybe of the minutia, that would be great. Sure. I mean, there are two parts of that question. You know, there's the how is the grant dispersed in the first place? And that's the thing I just described, you know, the study sections and, the, you know, there's a scoring uh, mechanism and then the, uh, you know, the grants with the best scores beneath, beneath that pay line we mentioned generally get funded. And that's sort of how peer review works. But an equally important question is uh, how can the NIH tell if it's funding the right grants? You know, how can it tell if its science is being successful? And this is a tough question. You know, you, you, you can um, fund a research area for many years and have little to show for it. And then all of a sudden that paper happens and, you know, you have, you know, a, a cure for Alzheimer's or something. Right. So so, uh, you know, ev evaluating biomedical research, even for experts in that topic, can be quite challenging. So one of the things the NIH does is it uses sort of metrics of grant success. And those are things like, uh, did the grant lead to a bunch of papers? So publications in peer reviewed journals, that's an important metric of success. Another is, uh, did the grant lead to a patent or the filing of some kind of intellectual property? And that's something the NCI, for example, watch, watch very closely and, and, and a very interesting set of statistics and gives a somewhat different answer from the paper answer. So the metric and the patent uh, metric don't correlate exactly as you might, you might expect. And then another another thing that uh, the the NIH looks at is you know does does those do those grants lead to some kind of clinical trial? Does a as an investigation? Does a study in humans come out of that work? And that that's particularly important in some of the health services research type science, which doesn't lead to necessarily medicines or or patents, but can lead to really practice changing you know trials in humans, and and, and often sometimes even influence policy. So, uh, you know, those are the kinds of tools uh, the NIH uses to evaluate the success of grants. And there are specialized grants like training grants. You look at how many trainees get funded and the cancer centers. You look at how you know, successful the cancer center is from a, a, an administrative point of view. So, you know, so the, the specific grants may have additional metrics. But in general, you know, what the NIH is trying to measure is impact of the science, which is a hard thing to do. But, but I think a key question to continue to ask. Uh, it's one, one important thing to know also about uh, grants that uh, I, I don't think people are generally aware of. The NIH both supports grants and contracts, and this is set up through federal law. So grants are governed by, I think, the Public Health Services Act and contracts are the FAR. And, uh, and so those have specific processes and goals. And, and by law, grants really don't have deliverables. So they're not, so we don't give a grant to say, someone and say, okay, now you got to give a, a, a list of all the genes you discovered or something. The, the grant is somewhat open-ended. 
And it's you're going to use those monies uh, as a credentialed, you know, a valid investigator. And you're going to send us progress reports that you know we monitor to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing with the money. But at the end of the day, there's not there, there's no like you know deliverable they supply to the NIH that, that sort of pay for the science. Now the NIH also uses a bunch of grants which do have deliverables. So they, you know, create a test for a new disease, or you know, make a standard, or you know, or, or create a new molecule or something. So those kinds of contracts are are quite uh, used quite a bit by NIH as well. But I, I think that many are confused about the, the, that nature of grants. They'll say, you know, why can't the NIH, you know, cut off a grant that doesn't do what we like? And, and the answer usually is grants are not contracts. Grants are not, you know, conditioned on any specific outcome. Thank you, and and, and thank you for that. Um, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna switch gears a little bit, and this is a, a bit of a lengthy question, but I think it's it's quite important from Lindsay. Um, and I'm going to read it verbatim, so please bear with me. Um, for this, in the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee hearing this morning, uh, both Senators Baldwin and Capito expressed some interest in bolstering certain bodies of research beyond what was first proposed in the PBR, the President's budget. This includes funding for research on maternal health, opioids, SUDs, child and child children's cancer, as examples. How should advocates approach their conversations with members of Congress and their NIH funding priorities in specific centers and institutes, keeping in mind the whole of the NIH budget being held at the fairly limited growth over many appropriation cycles? Yeah, well, that, that's a that's a terrific question, <laughs> uh, I, and I didn't I didn't hear the the appropriations here this morning. Uh, you know, I'm outside the Beltway now, so I don't like read Politico. The first thing I do when I wake up anymore, but uh, but I. Um, but I, I, you know, this is a familiar theme, and, and I, I know particularly some members of the Appropriation Committee uh, uh, have often been interested, for example, in childhood cancer, one of, the, one of the topics that was mentioned, and something where the NCI, you know, when I was there, really sought to respond to that goal. We launched a new $500 million cancer, childhood cancer data initiative at the behest of Congress and also a, 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 that was a priority of the White House. So I think... Um, uh, certainly, the NIH is very, very sensitive to the desires of Congress, which reflects the desires of the American public uh, for areas of research and, and things like opioids and childhood diseases and you know, the, the topics that were mentioned are, are laudable things that need additional support. And uh, the, the one of the so, so the answer is like the question is like, how do you sort of influence the behavior of the NIH or the, the various institutes and centers of the NIH? Uh, you know, report language was very meaningful. If, even if even if Congress didn't specifically appropriate funds for a topic, which it sometimes did, but uh, even even if it didn't do that, if it just said, you know, we're interested in one year it was carbon nuclei, you know, a new 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 radiation oncology modality, and the the NCI was we perked up and said we got to read up on this and, and decide what we're going to do in that area. So I, I think you know, just uh, stated preferences of members of Congress are something the, the NIH pays attention to. And so advocacy, you know, should work through members of Congress. That's a very, very powerful tool. If uh, if advocacy groups can convince uh, members of Congress, particularly those that sit on the Appropriations Committee, that something's important to the NIH, the NIH will definitely listen. That's not the sole avenue. Certainly, uh, advocacy can go directly to the NIH and the various ICs. And that, you know, I spent a great deal of my time at both the FDA and the NIH meeting with with with, with advocates for various uh, biomedical research and interests. And uh, you know, I think that's. It can be very, very effective, particularly uh, when advocacy comes with a positive sense of like, you know, the, the cut everybody else and give me all the money that doesn't work. But when it's, uh, you know, cancer research is important, but here's an here's an opportunity that you are missing. Here is an opportunity for research investment that uh, that the NCI should take advantage of. I found that very persuasive, you know, when people could show because, uh, you know, there is no uh, and, and, and the NIH should be very careful to dispel the sense that there's like a dollar per disease, right? It's it's not like we're going to, you know, look at how many people die of what and fund it per, per rata based on that. That doesn't make any sense from a scientific point of view. So the NIH really tries to fund things where there's scientific opportunity, where where, where the, the federal funds will efficiently lead to answering a question that will make a difference for the taxpayer. So I, I think that's where advocacy can very, be very, very convincing is, you know, the NCI or the NIH or NIAID should work on this area because there's a research opportunity that you are missing. That's great. Yes, I want to, Ned, I want to jump in and pick up a topic that we know uh, some uh, questioners have asked, which is, let's talk about the research that NIH funds that does not pl take place on our shores in the United States, but actually takes place overseas. Why should NIH undertake that kind of research? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. That's such an important topic, and it, it's 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 I think widely misunderstood. So I, I'd like the opportunity to speak to it. I mean, you know, uh, you know, when I started the NCI, uh, we fund a lot. The NCI funded a lot of research in other countries, uh, and some of it quite directly. You know, we would send money to a scientist in uh, another country, and, and I. Uh, I, I knew what those science were doing, and I thought it was very laudable and uh, good science and things that you know would be a benefit to a uh, cancer research mission. But I, I myself wondered how I was going to explain this to a skeptical member of Congress. And so I asked uh, my friend and colleague, Tony Fauci, how he handled this question, because NIAID has more overseas research than just about anybody. And Tony's answer was the answer I came to use as well, which is there are just certain kinds of experiments you can't do efficiently in the United States. And, 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 but there's a real interest for the American public and that science getting done. And so, you know, a good example would be uh, malaria research. You know, there's not much malaria in the United States, but malaria is super important from a global point of view. A large international malaria epidemic would affect the American economy very directly. So the America has an interest in good malaria research getting done in other countries. So that's, that's an obvious easy one. Uh, it's also true at the NCI. So for example, um, there is a disease, Hodgkin's disease, that we usually cure in the United States. It has a 95, 98% cure rate, but there might be an easier, better way to cure it. There, there might be a way to use sort of less, less intense therapy to get to that cure. That trial, to, to compare the standard of care in the U.S. versus a, a de-escalation trial, if you will, really couldn't be done in the United States for a variety of reasons. The clinicians wouldn't enroll their patients to it, but it could be done in countries where you know, the health system, uh, you know, has different practices than what's done in the United States. So that, that's a trial that could be done internationally, but not in the United States. But, you know, if that trial were successful and you showed you could cure that same disease with less intensive therapy, that would change the American standard of care. Finally, there, there are, are, are certain, you know, parts of the United States, frankly, that, are, that have very diminished access to health care, that have, uh, you know, intense persistent poverty, they have structural inequity, they have, uh, you know, no physician for 50 miles. They, they, they are, these are difficult areas to do healthcare delivery. And to study those, those under-resourced uh, uh, populations is quite challenging. Those, those individuals don't go into the healthcare system. So some of those research questions can be asked in other countries more efficiently than they can be asked in the United States. So I think if you care about something like, you know, what's the best way to do healthcare delivery to under-resourced populations, uh, you know, sometimes international studies are the best way to go. A really good example of this is the most important cancer prevention study going on in the world right now is actually happening in Costa Rica. It's an NCI funded study. Can one shot of the HPV vaccine prevent HPV associated cancers, human papillomavirus uh, uh, cancers as efficiently as two? So, you know, that trial we couldn't do in the United States for a variety of reasons. But if that's true, if, if one shot is good enough and we can show that in the Costa Rican population, then that would transform how HPV uh, is prevented on a global scale. So it's a really important trial. It's a healthcare delivery question that will have tremendous implications for how patients are cared for in the United States, even though we really couldn't do that trial in the US for any reasons. So I think international studies are important. It's a good use of federal funds, but it's uh, you know obviously appropriate for Congress to continue to ask, do we really need to do that trial in other countries? Should those dollars be going to an American institution? So I thought about that on a daily basis when I was in the NCI, and I think the rest of the NIH does as well. So as we know, some of the research that has been funding research undertaken in other countries has generated controversy. We'll point to the controversy over so-called gain of function research in viruses. I know you're not a virologist uh, and it is important to acknowledge legitimate concerns about lab safety in this country as well as overseas. But why is it important to fund those kinds of activities, including research undertaken around the world? Right, I think that, um, uh, you know, if you're worried about a, a global pandemic, having an understanding of the agent that might cause that pandemic before it happens is very desirable, right? So, you know, it's too late to wait until the flu epidemic is ravaging to do the flu research. And so, uh, you know, coronaviruses are something that cause global pandemics and have in the past and, and, and most recently, of course, cause a very important pandemic and will again in the future. So research around the nature of coronaviruses is, of course, an appropriate question for NIAID and the NIH to be interested in. Gain of function research is potentially dangerous. It's to take a viruses that exist in nature and mutate them in a way that can make them more pathogenic. And that's why it is tightly regulated by the NIH. And, and there are sections, you know, and I am not a virologist and I will not be able to speak on the, the specificity of a gain of function research. But suffice it to say, 
uh, you know, uh, that kind of research makes everybody a bit nervous. And therefore, we want really smart people making sure that it's done for a legitimate purpose when it is done at all. Uh, having said that, I, 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 I hope that, uh, you know, no one will conclude from the recent pandemic that we don't need like pandemic research. Obviously, we do. It has to be carefully done. It has to be regulated. It has to be done with careful oversight. But, you know, a pandemics are going to happen. They are devastating when they occur. And therefore, it's in everyone's interest to try and understand the agents that cause those pandemics beforehand. And as you said earlier, the kind of basic, almost platform research that NIH is able to fund for years uh, gave us, for example, the mRNA vaccine platform that we were able to capitalize on uh, in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Yeah, but by the way, that's a particularly worthwhile example because that sort of started out as a cancer thing. So people were developing those technologies as cancer therapies, and then were rapidly pivoted to uh, infectious disease when the time came. And you know, CAR T cells, which are now used to cure people with cancer, started out as an HIV research area. So, you know, that's sort of the virtue of basic science and basic biomedical investigation is you never quite know where it's going to go. So we might think you're working on a cancer topic or an infectious disease topic, and it might have a benefit in some other disease area you never imagined. And that's what the NIH does well. That kind of research doesn't really occur in industry. So let's close by asking a question that again came in from the audience earlier, which is, Given your career uh, uh, and your leadership role at NCI and your ability now to reflect uh, outside the halls of, uh, of the NIH, what could the NIH do better? And what is the NIH collectively and what are the institutes and centers doing themselves now to achieve these important improvements? Yeah, I, I, I thank you for the question. You know, I, I, I you know, love the NIH and I love the NCI and I, I, it was a real privilege and an honor to work there. And uh, and I think they're great organizations and, and really, uh, as, I, as I said at the outset, do a terrific job of meeting the national research mission. But it is a good question to continually ask, you know, what could we do better or differently that would improve, uh, you know, the goals of the, NIH, you know, of the mission of the NIH. And, you know, I was very worried when I was there about you know both the 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 pay line issue we already talked about you know the impact of this sort of competition for funding on researchers and that's something where you know congress can help in a very direct way through appropriations but i was equally worried about the sort of bureaucratic load that we're imposing on scientists uh because of you know well-intentioned and well-meaning things but the the sort of application that a, a scientist needs to create now to get funding from the nih Every year it gets a little more complicated, a little bit worse. And, and, and my scientist colleagues in academia tell me that like half their life now is spent filling out forms for the federal government. And that is not a good use of uh, their time. So I, I'm worried that, um, you know, the, the intent is good is to try and, you know, monitor what scientists are doing and have some control over, over, over academic research. But at some point, this crushing load, you know, of, of sort of bureaucracy that scientists have to deal with uh, will uh, harm uh, American research. So the, the, the intense competition for pay lines, plus the, uh, you know, my job is no fun anymore because I got to do paperwork all the time. That's, that's, that's a threat to American science. And, and so I think, you know, the NIH has to ask itself, can it be part of the solution there? there? Can it require less paperwork? Can it streamline that process? Can it use things online as opposed, you know, all these kinds of weedy questions. Uh, I tried to do some of that when I was at the NCI. Uh, probably our biggest success in that area was we were allowed certain grants to, you know, apply less frequently. So instead of doing it every five years, we allowed some people to apply every seven years, uh, thereby de decreasing the bureaucracy by 40% since writing the grant is the worst part. But, you know, that, that was not a complete solution. Obviously, you know, the whole applications process, I think, could be revisited. And, and that would be a, a good question to ask, is, is, is this structure that we've created to make sure that the NIH is doing things right, is, is, it, is it getting, you know, beyond the point of its use? I think it's also a fair question to ask, is the administrative structure of the NIH you know, the right structure? Should it be streamlined in some way? Is there really, are there efficiencies? Uh, are there things that each IC does that is duplicative, duplicative? And I'm glad Congress has been interested in that topic and should be continued to be interested in that topic. But th those are the, uh, you know, I, I think the NIH has a great vision, has great support, bipartisan great support from Congress and, 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 and does what it's supposed to do for the most part. But I worry about you know, these things like pay lines and bureaucratic load and administrative structure that uh, could compromise uh, the national research mission if we don't pay attention to them.
And Susan and Ned, I'm so sorry I need to, to jump in, but I'll say that that's a terrific last question and last answer because I don't think anyone in Congress outside of that advocates want a wasted dollar against medical progress. That's a, that's a tragedy. Um, so I, you know. I, I totally agree. I think if people sort of knew how much of uh, you know a scientist's time is not doing science these days, uh, they would be concerned. So so exactly. I think that is uh, and. That's not solely caused by the NIH, that's caused by lots of things, but the yeah. NIH is part of that problem and could be part of that solution. Well, this has been such a terrific conversation and, and really great questions that we weren't able to get to. Nico's, yours were terrific and many here on the, the chat, but Susan and Ned, I just have to thank you so much. We could not have asked for a better conversation with better conversants. <laughs> um, and thanks to everyone on the line. Um, please, I think my emails in the chat or should be um, shoot me a line if you want to follow up on any of the questions we missed or you just want to gab. Um, Research America is here for you. And, and thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Susan and Ned. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Here, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.